Oh, yeah, I did. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Let's get started here. So I've already been asked about the test, and let's, let's take the last 10 minutes of class to do that. Will someone stop me if I go too far, 2.30? Okay. Um, all right, so I, I sat down this morning and uh, I got on my little tablet here and I, I started to do like just a big summary of the main ideas with the solids of revolution and that's what I've handed to you. I know it's really hard to see this and I, I'm sorry, it looked better on my, on my screen than it did when I printed it out. Um, but this just kind of summarizes everything and it, and it does it in, in uh, the most abstract format that I could give. Um, you have to be a little careful with this when you read through this if, you know, if you're going to use it. Um, because what we saw, what we've seen in the last few classes is that when you rotate, when you rotate some region about a horizontal line, your formula that you wind up with, everything is basically dictated by where this line is relative to your region. You know, if your line is, is right here, then your your outer radius is, is this distance, but if your line's down here, then you have, to, you have to measure, you know, what's this distance plus the function. If it's up here, then it's going to be this distance minus the function. So it's hard to, I could give you like every scenario, but this is tr kind of like trying to generalize it as, as much as I could, all right? The main idea is that you have to draw a picture and try and determine what this outer and inner radius are, right? And then the formula is just pi integral a to b, blah, 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 right? So this is the method of washers. That's the technical name for it. And in case I did not emphasize this enough last class, you know that you're using washers when your rectangle is what? Perpendicular, Perpendicular to your axis of rotation. Now, in the notes, I use a different word. I use the word orthogonal, which is another name for perpendicular. All right, so I prefer to use orthogonal, but sometimes I use perpendicular. So um, if you ever see perpendicular, or if you ever see orthogonal in the book, that's perpendicular. That's what that means. All right, so that's how we know when we're, we're using washers. Also, um, you know, when we look at our region, another thing we want to consider is if we're going to draw a rectangle in there and move it from left to right, that the top function and bottom function always stay the same, right? That's, that's one of the conditions we need. And then I, I, you know, I drew what the washer looks like and all that, okay? And then I did the same thing, but sideways, right? So if we want to use washers and our rectangle is going to go this way now, our axis of rotation is going to be vertical, so they're orthogonal, then we use our washer method and our washer goes this way instead, and the formula changes just a little bit. We go from C to D instead of A to B, uh, we have an outer and inner radius, they're both squared still, and then it's with respect to y instead of x. So you have to look at that region and have to make sure that your function on the right and function on the left always stay the same as you move your rectangle up and down, right? And these functions are functions of y, not x. All right, so that's washers in a, in a nutshell. And then we get to shells, which was what we ended class with last time. And with shells, we never got to, we never did a problem. I just asked you to take, what was it, sine x? Yeah. It was sine x and we tried to wrap it around the y-axis. And we did it and we came up with a formula and that was the end of class. What we never did was try to, try to take this and wrap it around a vertical line that wasn't the y-axis. Okay, now, so this is new, all right? So I want us to kind of, um, Let's do an example, and then we'll, we'll come back to the notes. How about that? Where is it? Come on, man. There you are. All right, so let's do an example. Let's go back to that sine x problem. So we're going to say find volume of solid generated 
by rotating the shown region about, and I'm going to have us do several things, y, um, the y-axis, x equals negative 2, and x equals 5. So I have to give you a picture here so you know what I'm talking, what region I'm talking about. So we've got the sine function, and I'm just going to look at the first arc of sine right here, there, from here to here. That's y equals sine x, and we're talking about that region right there. Okay? I want that region wrapped around the y-axis, then wrapped around x equals negative 2, then x equals 5, and come up with formulas for, for the solid generated by doing that. Are we clear on the question? On the questions? Yes? Sure? Okay, so why are we not going to use washers? Yes, so if, our, if we look at part A, our axis of rotation is here, right? So if we're going to have our axis of rotation vertical and we use washers, then our rectangles must be perpendicular. And if I draw a perpendicular rectangle in here, the right function and left function are actually the same function, right? So there's, that's not a good choice. So then we instead use shells. And the, the thing about shells is shells allows you to draw your rectangle parallel to your axis of rotation. So my rectangle would go in here like this, my arbitrary rectangle, and then I'm going to wrap it around this axis right here. This is part A I'm doing here, right? Agreed? So when I do that, I guess I'll do it below this. I have my, my y-axis here. I have my rectangle here, don't I? Yeah. And that thing's going to get wrapped around and create that shell. I'm not going to draw the shell. But let's start labeling some things on this. Do we know the height of that shell? Yes, what is it? Sine x, which is the top function, minus the bottom function, which is 0. Right? So that's just sine x. And it will always be that the entire time it's being wrapped around. Or sorry, not the... The entire time this rectangle's moved. See, because what we're doing is we're like taking a rectangle, wrapping it. Moving a little bit, wrapping. Moving, wrapping. So we have an infinite number of wraps. And as we move it, this will always be, um, the top will always be sine, the bottom will always be zero. Okay, what else do we need? According to this on the back here, we're looking at the method of shells, the second box there, right? So we need to know, we need to know what, what capital R is, right? This right here was the, was the F minus G, wasn't it? That was this part. But I also need to know what capital R is. And capital R is what, according to the, it says it on here. Capital R is the distance from the axis of rotation to your rectangle, right? And for us, that's axis of rotation to the rectangles there, which is this right here. And what is that? I told you last class. That's going to always be x. OK, so let's, let's burn this into our brains. The distance from the y-axis to the rectangle is always x. And the reason it's x is because what are we going to let x vary between here? In this particular problem, it's uh, what? 0 and this is pi, right? So when we do an integral from 0 to pi, what we're doing is we're allowing x to move from 0 all the way to pi. Right? And that means the radius, as I move out, that radius is going to change, right? And that's the variable that's changing, x, right? The x coordinate, okay? So that's our, this happens to be our capital R. So from there, we can just go straight to the formula, right? The volume of that will be 2 pi, then what? Integral, 0 pi, and then capital R x and then 
sine x and dx, right? The dx, the dx comes from the little infinitesimal thickness of our shell. That's what we did last class, right? We did that. We ended class with that, I believe. Okay, now let's do, that's part A. Let's take a look at what part B would look like. Because B is going to be different, right? Our axis of rotation is somewhere else. So I'm going to start with the new picture. So for B, I have my sine curve here again. I know that's pi, I know that's zero. I'm trying to get that region right there. I'm trying to wrap it around what this time? X is gonna be uh, negative two, right? So that is a vertical line through negative two over here. So this is my axis of rotation. Sometimes I dot them, especially if you're drawing with a, like just a pencil, right? Then you, to distinguish them, you can put a dotted one for your axis of rotation, solid one for your, for your x and y axes. Okay, I don't want to use washers, right? Same story, I want to use shells. So here's my rectangle that I'm gonna wrap. If I draw this thing down here, got my axis of rotation. Look at, I'm putting my y-axis also, and then I'm bringing my rectangle down. So you all see I'm just kind of like bringing everything down without the graphs. Now, how tall is the rectangle? That's still sine x. That's your f minus g. But here's where things change. What is your capital R? x plus 2. So what it is is we know from the y-axis to the rectangle, from the y-axis to the rectangle I told you is always going to be x, right? So this distance from here to here is x. However, the distance from here to here is 2 because, you know, you measure it. That's 2, right? So capital R is that entire distance would be this plus this, so 2 plus x or x plus 2. doesn't matter how you do that, right? That's your capital R. Y'all see the difference? Everything else is exactly the same. The integral is going to look identical, except our capital R is going to be this instead. So the volume of this will be 2 pi integral, 0 to pi still, right? 0 to pi. But then our capital R, which is x plus 2, but then times the height of the function, which, or the height of the rectangle, which is sine x, then times the, the thickness of it, which is dx. I could also use integration by parts on this. I could let u be that, and that be dv, and it would work the same way, except it would look a little different when you do your ultraviolet minus voodoo, but the, the technique would be the same, right? Because this is a linear function, so when you take its derivative, you're just going to get one. Things are going to get nice. You could also split it into two, but that's kind of making more work than you need. If you do here to here and here to here, sine x times x, that you could do integration by parts, and then two sine x, you integrate that, and you're going to get like negative two cosine x. So you could do it that way also. Okay, part B, is that clear? Okay, let's do part C. I guess I could have left that picture there, but so for C, I had a student in my other class asking me, do I have to draw the pictures or can I just put the formula down there, like on the test? And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to see your pictures. Um, and I'll tell you all the same thing. Like, if you, if you just give me the formula, at the, you know, just write the formula down, and you're doing it all in your head, good for you. But if you get it wrong, it's, it's all wrong. You know, I'm going to take off every point possible. If you draw a picture, but then somehow you mess up your formula, then I'm going to give you partial credit. All right? So the more, the, the more I see, the, the better. Remember, the whole point of the test of me asking you not to continue doing it 
is to show me that you can develop the integral in a nice, clear, concise manner. All right? My axis of rotation on this one is, is 5, right? And 5 is bigger than pi? Right, because pi is 3.14. So you know, like we're like over here at 5, and this is my axis of rotation now. And so now I, I kind of play the same game. Here's my y-axis. Oh, I forgot to draw my rectangle. Here's my rectangle. Here's my rectangle. And then here's my axis of rotation. All right? So we want to know capital R. Capital R is the distance from the axis of rotation to your rectangle. So we're talking about this distance, right? Yeah. That's what we want. So what is that distance? Five minus, five minus x. So if this distance from the y-axis to the rectangle is always x, then if the whole thing is five, right, because that's, what, five, right? Then that distance has to be five take away x. And that's it. So our formula changes a little bit again. Not much, but does change. So the volume of this would be 2 pi, integral 0 to pi, radius 5 minus x, sine x, dx. Box it up and move on. So what you should expect on the exam, which is when? Because 16th. So we've got a ways to go still. All right. Um, what you should expect on the exam is for me to give you, you know, here are some curves, right? Then you have to come up with a region. So imagine that I give you some region that you have to come up with, right? These might be functions of x, they might be functions of y, it doesn't matter. And then, then what you should expect is for me to ask you to wrap that region around the x-axis, y-axis, some horizontal line this way, some horizontal line above it. So I'm probably going to give you one below and above, and then one to the left and to the right of it. So essentially, look at it this way, x-axis, then one below and one above, and then y-axis, and then one over here and one over here. Now, I could put one right there, right? You see, when I say over here, I don't necessarily mean on that side of the y-axis. Just not the y-axis into the left of the region. So six total formulas for each region I give you, and I'll probably give you three regions. Would yes? You're just going to write the formula down. That's it. Yep. You just take it to here, and then, then you go to the next problem. All right? Now, I'm going to give you multiple problems, so I'm going to give you a region. Maybe the first region is going to be real nice, F on top, G on the bottom, right? Everything's nice and clean. You're going to do rectangle like that. So if I ask you to wrap this way, what would you use? Uh, washers. washers, right? Now if I start ask you to wrap this way, you should probably just use shells, right? You could do all three, all of the ones that wrap on any vertical line, you can do all of them with shells. But this way, you're going to use the washers because you want to be perpendicular and it's F on top, G on the bottom. Now if I give you something like this, where perhaps your functions are functions of y instead, um, instead of x, right? Then you're going to probably want to do your rectangles this way, right? Because you'll have the one on the right and the one on the left never change. Yes? So when we go this way, ooh. When you go this, okay, hold on. When we go this way, what would you use? washers because your axis of rotation will be orthogonal to your rectangle. When you go this way though, shells, shells in that direction, how would that work? Same way, right? So we haven't done one yet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I first started teaching Cal 2, the first time I taught Cal 2, I said, if you ever had a function like this, I said just switch all your x's to y's and all your y's to x's. And that's essentially rotating it. And then I realized later, shit, I can't do that. I shouldn't teach that because when you get to Cal 3 and you have problems like that, you can't just switch x and y because you've also got z. 
And did I tell you all about right hand rule and like we have to orient the space properly and you, no, I didn't say that in here. No. Where I said go to the other room and look at this from the other side. I didn't say that in here. I'm sorry. It's hard when you teach two of the same class because you know you can imagine you forget what you say. Um, so I'll just say this real quick to you. Um, I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm just telling you I don't teach it that way because of because of 3D. So when when you're talking when we're everything that we've done in, in this class pretty much has all been based upon a two-dimensional flat sheet of paper where we have an x-axis and a y-axis. And the x-axis over here, this is the positive direction, that's the positive direction, right, of the y. So if somebody were to get all crazy and be like, no, no, I'm a rebel, man. And so I, I want that to be my positive x-axis, and I want this to be my positive y-axis, man, you know. Then can we still do the math, like if they decide to do it that way? Can we still draw, like, if I draw, like y equals x squared, right? Over here it looks like this, yes? But over here it looks like what? Like that, right? So is it okay to draw your axes this way and not this way in two-dimensional space? And the answer is yes, it is okay because there is a way to twist, turn, flip, or something to make one of these look like the other. So one easy way you could, I don't know if this is easy, but you know, when I'm standing here looking at this, I see x positive, y positive, right? So if I go and I walk out the classroom and I go to the other side of the board, if I could kind of see transparently through the board, right? Imagine you're in the other room. So I'm in the other room, and I'm looking at this from the other side, and I turn my head like that, then I'm going to see x and y, right? Yeah. Do you all see that? So this is just a, if I twist it and flip it, then it's that. And that's... We, we call these two things isomorphic. They're, they're the same, basically. But when you get to three-dimensional space, you can't do that. So when you get to three-dimensional space, so when you were saying you would just do the problem but turn your head, like you're allowed to in two-dimensional space. But in 3D, we do something like this. We have what's called the right-hand rule. And for those of you who have taken physics, you know what I'm talking about. It says when we draw three-dimensional space in X, Y, and Z axis, it's kind of like the corner of the room over here. We have like, this is the origin, and then we have the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis goes up, all right? Now, somebody else could decide to do it a different way. Someone else could have said, all right, I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to be a rebel. I don't like that. I'm going to do it this way and switch the x, y, and z, the x and the y. Just switch those. Now, in 2D, that doesn't matter, but in 3D, it does. So any math that you do here is not going to be the same as what you do here just turns out that way because there's no way to twist, turn, flip, or do anything to make this look like that. You can't do it. All right? So the right-hand rule says that when you draw your, and this is something we all had to agree, agree on, like as humans, we have to say, let's agree on this. Okay, that way we don't have people doing different things in different spaces. So we agreed that you get your right hand, and when you draw the X, Y, Z three-dimensional space, your fingers should always point down the positive x-axis, all right? If you point your fingers down the positive x-axis, so I'm pointing my fingers down here, then the y-axis will always be where your fingers curl to. So when I curl my fingers, that should go, start pointing towards my y-positive axis. And then my thumb should be pointing in the positive z direction. That's the way we draw it, okay? Now notice over here, if I point my fingers down the positive x-axis, then will this work? No, because if I curl my fingers, they're not going towards this, right? So I'd actually have to flip my hand over like that, wouldn't I? <laughs> I'd have to flip my hand over like this, and then it would curl. But now where's my thumb? Down. So this is incorrect unless I put z down here. Now if I put z positive down there, that's okay, because that's that. Just turn it, right? So, right-hand rule. I'll never forget a, a class I took in college. It was an undergraduate course. It was called Non-Euclidean Geometry. It's basically like, like you, know how, you know how all the geometry that we've learned has always been based on this idea of like two-dimensional space, three-dimensional space, that these, these things come together at right angles? Yeah. That's Euclidean space, all right? You can have spaces where things don't come together at right angles. So anything that doesn't do this is called non-Euclidean. 
All right, so you have, I took this class called Non-Euclidean Geometry. So <clears throat> in one of the problems we were doing, I was working on, um, we, I don't know, I had to, we had to actually draw something in a different space. So we took something in two-dimensional space like Euclidean and converted it to some other space. And so I did the drawing <coughs> and I took it up and I was talking to the professor and, I, and she was like, no, that's not right. And I was like, no, I'm, I mean, look, I'm using the right hand rule and stuff like that. And, blah, blah, blah. and she's like, that's your left hand. I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was using my left hand. I did, I did made up my own left hand rule. And so we all agree right hand rule, okay? Not left hand rule. <clears throat> Do y'all want an example of a non-Euclidean space you, you, that I'm sure you've seen before? See, look, y'all have got me off on a tangent. I'm blaming you. It's not even your fault. <laughs> okay, so look, check this out. This is, a, this is an example of a Euclidean space. This is me drawing a road with two buildings on the side. Okay? Everything's flat, right? I have the road has curbs. I've got a dashed line in the middle. I've got these buildings. I'm looking from the top <laughs> down, right? Would you say that's a pretty good drawing of a road? in two buildings? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's <laughs> nice, isn't it? But um, it's not very good in terms of like, I could be better, right? The problem is I'm trying to draw something that, that lives in three-dimensional space. I'm trying to draw it on a flat sheet of paper, right? Yeah. It's hard to draw something in 3D on 2D. So we have to use a different type of, of math, a different geometry. So in this, in this geometry, the reason I drew, drew the road like this is because these lines should be parallel, right? Because they're the curbs. And then, you know, these lines, this, cor this edge of the building, this edge of the building are parallel. These are parallel. So that's right angles, right? So we have all these Euclidean rules. Parallel lines look like train tracks, right? But if I really want to trick my eye into thinking that something on two-dimensional a two-dimensional surface is actually three-dimensional, I have to break the Euclidean rule. So it's not Euclidean, Euclidean anymore. What it is is the new rule now is that any lines that are parallel are actually going to meet at a point. So, so this is called perspective. Any parallel lines will meet at a point. And that point is called the vanishing point. So that's not a great picture, but it's decent enough to get the point across. So look, in, in this picture, this is parallel to this, is parallel to this, is parallel to that, to that. All those are parallel, right? Yeah. They never intersect each other in Euclidean geometry. But in non-Euclidean geometry, in, in what's called, this is one, there's all sorts of different non-Euclidean geometries, but this one in particular, um, all those parallel lines, here they are, and that was that top edge, you know, all those lines are all meeting somewhere, aren't they? And then I draw my little horizon up here, and I draw my little trees or whatever, you know. And you start. So in order to trick the eye, you've got to break the Euclidean rules, right? And that's why, that's why humans got better at drawing as time went on. It's because we realized the actual mathematics behind what was going on, if that makes any sense. All right. Whoa. How did that happen? Let's move on to new material. It's new, but we're, we're still in a, oh, you know what? Is there a homework assignment from 7-3? I don't think there is. And I don't think I've done any videos. I could be wrong. Is there anything assigned off of page 385 or 384 on your schedule? No? OK, so I think I want you to, to do some problems with shells. I mean, you should practice, right? Okay, so here's, here's what you should do. This is 7.3, page uh, 385. Problem 3, 5, 15, 16, 19, 20. I don't have solution videos for these. Maybe. I doubt, I doubt it's going to happen. I'll, t I'll be honest with you. This is a crazy, very busy week for me. Let's put the 
You'll, yeah, you'll have at least answers in the back, but they're going to take it all the way. They're going to yeah. do the whole thing, right? They're going to find the volume. So that's all you're going to see is the answer. All right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm talking about right now. Yep. So we, we are moving on to something new, but we're still in 7.2. So the way this book does this, they do 7.2, they do washers, and then they do this weird thing at the end, and then they do 7.3, which is shells. And I like to do washers followed by shells immediately, and then get to the little thing at the end of 7.2 that they want to talk about. So I also today played with cardboard and scissors and markers in my office, and I made this absolutely amazing visual display here. Look at this. Isn't this incredible? Isn't that incredible? It is. It's nice. Okay, so let's say that we have two curves, right? And we have a region bounded by the two curves, which is in here. We've seen this, right? With that region, we can find its area, we can wrap it around different things, right? Now in this case, we could not wrap it around the x-axis because the axis of rotation would be in the middle of the region. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've conveniently avoided that, haven't I? The axis of rotation has always been outside the region. That's intentional, all right? But we could find this area. Okay, so here's what I'd like for you to do. Let me just say this in words. I'd like for you to take, um, Take some, I want you to make a solid object out of this picture. But it's no rotations anymore. Just look at this. I want you to imagine that that's, that's the ground, okay? So this is on the ground, all right? And there's some solid sitting up here above it, okay? The base of that solid, the bottom of the solid, is exactly this edge and this edge, all right? So if I were to take this solid, and pick it up and look at it, right? It would, it, would look, it would look like this from the bottom, right? Here's what I'm going to tell you about that solid, okay, that's sitting here. If you take cross sections of this solid that are perpendicular to the x-axis, they form equilateral, equilateral triangles. What? Okay, let me say it again. Whatever this solid is, if I take cross sections of it, so if I come in here with a little a knife, okay, if I were to come in here with a knife, do you all see that there's some solid up here? You don't know where, what it looks like yet, okay? But if I take a, a knife and I cut, right, a piece, and I peel off that piece and I look at it from the side, the cross section is going to look like an equilateral triangle, all right? I brought more visual aids. So if I take a cross section right here, now, the, I said um, cross-sections that are perpendicular to the x-axis, so I'm cutting this way. And when I do that, and I take, imagine I take a little sliver, just maybe I cut it twice, just take a little, little infinitesimal sliver out of that solid, and I take that little sliver and I look at it, it's a little equilateral triangle. Equilateral means all sides same length, right? Okay, so if I cut it over here, I'm going to get that triangle, yes? Okay, what if I cut it a little bit further in? I'm going to have a bigger triangle because when I cut it and take it off, the base, right, this, this base is dictated by the distance between these two. Move <laughs> further out, right, I've got that. Yes? One more. Here, right there, cross section, right? So if i trying to get you to see what this solid looks like, I've got this guy sitting here, right, and then I've got... This guy's further this way, yes? And then, yeah, you get the idea? What is the volume of that object? That's the question. Now, this is the same thing, okay? But here I can do it a lot, lot better, I think. Okay, you see that? So what happens as I start to move my triangle towards the edge, the triangles get, I mean, as I move the, the cut, as the cut goes to the edge, the triangles get small. As the cut goes more towards the center, the triangles get bigger, and then go the other way, they start to get smaller, right? 
And if I were to put all of that together into one big massive solid, I would get this shape right here. Let me bring that thing back over to the other side. That's where I'm cutting it. And that thing is a solid, right? And that thing has a volume. And what is the volume? <coughs> yes? Oh, I don't know what to ask for that. Yeah. Well, how do you know it does that instead of just being like... You're being told. <laughs> so, so it's, what this is saying is come up with... So first they have to give you the two functions, okay? They give you the two curves. They say, okay, these two curves form a region, all right? That region that they form is the base of a solid. Let me tell you a little bit about this solid. If you take cross sections that are perpendicular to the x-axis, you get little equilateral triangles. Okay? So that's all given to you. Now the question is, what is its volume? Make sense? Okay. Let's start over. Why did I use equilateral triangles? I don't know. Because that's what I decided to use, right? Yeah. Okay, start over. New problem. See the region bounded by these two curves? Yeah. When I take perpendicular cross sections that are, I'm sorry, when I take cross sections that are perpendicular to the x-axis, when I look at those, they form squares. Not equilateral triangles. It's a different object, right? This looks different. There they are. <laughs> little square, right? I'm going to have a little square here because the base of that little square is coming from this distance from here to here, right? As I move in, bigger squares, right? And then I get in the middle, I got this real big square in the middle, right? <laughs> What's the volume of that? Now the computer is here because the computer can draw me the whole picture. So I'm just going to change that to squares now. And can you see that it's, that it's a different object? I mean, look at it. I've got little squares down there. I'm going to get big squares up here, small again. If I put them all together, I get that object, right? Now I'll switch it. There's the squares. There's the triangles. Very different, aren't they? Yeah. And then I could just go crazy with this. What if I told you that perpendicular or cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis were semicircles, half circles. See that? Go around. Okay. What if they're full circles? It's almost like a little football. Well, I guess. A what? Yeah. And then what else do we have here? Uh, rectangles. Now, this rectangles one is a little interesting. Because if I tell you that the cross section is a rectangle, I actually have to tell you, if I tell you it's a rectangle, you know this side and this side are the same. But you don't know how tall it is, so I would have to tell you something about the relationship between the height and the width of this. Like maybe I say it forms rectangles where the, the height is half the length or something like that. Square, it's easy because they're all the same, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what, there was a none on here? What happens there? I have a feeling, of, oh, yeah, none. <laughs> I just don't remember putting that into my code that I put none in there. Hmm. Yeah, because I wanted to start it off with like, hey, here's our region. Okay. You get a basic idea of what's happening here? Yes? All right, so let's, let's do one of these. Well, yeah, and let's just get right into it. The base of a solid is the region bounded by Let's keep this simple for our first example. y equals x squared, y equals mm, 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 4 minus x squared. Okay. 
find the volume of the solid if cross sections perpendicular or orthogonal, perpendicular, I'm just going to say perp, is that all right? Mm -hmm. Perpendicular to the x-axis form what? What should we start with? Triangle. We can do triangles, equilateral triangles, then we can do squares, then we can do semicircles. Yeah. We'll do those. And let, let's do all three, and let's do them in order from easy to hard, okay? So we're going to start actually with squares. Part B, equilateral triangles. And then part C, semicircles. Semicircles are half circles, right? We should get different formulas for each one of these, right? Yes. Let me start with the graph. of the region. X squared and then 4 minus X squared are my two functions, right? Okay, we are not doing solids of revolution. No more washers, no more shells right now, because we're, we're not being asked to rotate anything around any axes, right? We're just being asked to consider this particular solid that has that region as its base, and that cross sections form these weird shapes. All right? So, here's how I like to do it. First, what I do is I try and draw this picture as if it's laying on the ground. So, I'm going to draw in three-dimensional space on a flat sheet of paper. So here's how you should, well, there's different ways to draw 3D on 2D. Like in physics, a lot of times physics, they'll do, like I did earlier, they'll do like X, Y, and then Z like that. Um, but for this, I'm going to do something a little bit different. So tr try this if you've never tried to draw this 3D before. Gosh, that's terrible. Gone. All right, so here is our, this is going to be our z-axis. So this is the, like, over there. Now I'm going to draw the x and y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an x, like an x, but I'm going to squash it like this. Okay, so watch. Y'all see that? Yeah? It, it, it's going to work now. Now look, this is my x-axis. I'm going to let my x-axis be right here. My y-axis is here, and then my z-axis here. I'm not going to label it z because we don't really need it. Can you, can you all see that all I've done is I've taken this picture right here, and we're looking at it like from that point of view right there? Yes? Okay, I'm going to try and draw that picture onto this, onto this right here. So look at my parabola. This, this takes some time and practice. Here's my parabola laying on the ground. See, it's not, it's not you don't draw it like you draw here where it's like, ref, like a reflection. You have to kind of, like I said, this takes a little time to get decent at this. And then here's my parabola going the other way, laying on the ground. Do you all see it? Don't worry about, I mean, you're not going to be tested on how good your drawing is, all right? What I'm going to, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to try and help motivate where we're going to get the formula from, okay? You all ready? Okay, here we go. We're going to do, we're going to call on our good old trusty integral. And we're going to imagine one of our slices, right? Now our slice is perpendicular to the x-axis, yes? 
But with this slice, I'm going to imagine that it has a little bit of width to it. So I'm going to, it's almost going to be like it was before, this infinitesimal rect rectangular slice. So that's like this little guy right here, right? Had a little bit of thickness to it. Yes? Now, that slice sitting over here is like, like here, isn't it? Somewhere around there? And I'm supposed to create what out of that? You know, I think I'm going to do that in green. A square. So I'm supposed to create a square off of this. So that means whatever that width is, or whatever that length is there, I've got to go up and over and down the same length, right? So I've got to go up and over and down the same length. Yes? Now that little square thing that I just did has a little bit of thickness to it, doesn't it? So I'm going to just draw a little bit of thickness onto that. Well, crap, that's just this. Right? That's me zoomed in on it, yes? Do you agree that if I could find a formula for the volume of that, I would have the volume of one slice? And what we want to do is add up all those volumes if we imagine moving this slice through the entire region. This is shit we've done already, right? Sorry, I'm cussing too much today. <laughs> Right? We've done this already. We have, we have the whole idea behind even this, the washers, we start with the rectangle and we move it left and right, right? And we get an infinite number of them, we add them up. The only difference here is that we're not wrapping anything. We're just coming up with a formula for this particular sliver and then we're adding them up and that's where the integral comes in. So we still need a formula for this. So can you tell me how wide this is? Like from here to here? Isn't that from here to here? And what is that? It's going to be the 4 minus x squared guy, right? This one? Minus the x squared guy. That's like f minus g again, isn't it? So that distance right there is 4 minus x squared minus x squared. Now, I didn't need the parentheses, but I'm just trying to stress that this is kind of like the top guy minus the bottom guy. And that's really 4 minus 2x squared. Yes? Questions on that? Because we're, we're pretty much there at, almost at this point. Because if this is how wide this is, and it's a square, that's also how tall it is. And if that's how tall it is, and we're trying to find the volume of this, the only thing left is how thick it is. Right? We have like the length and the height, thickness. And that's what? dx. dx. Right? That goes back to what that was. That's our little dx right there. And so the volume of this is length times width times height. Right? So the volume of this guy, just this one, the volume of that is these three multiplied. So it's 4 minus 2x squared, right? 4 minus 2x squared times itself. So squared. Yes? Right? So it's this times this. So it's that times itself. Oh, wait. Whoa. Hold on. Did I miss my two? I missed my two here. My apologies there. That should be a two. Yeah, yeah. That's a two there. Minus two. X squared. So this one times this one. They're the same expression. So we square it. And then times dx. That is the volume of one little slice. Right? Now add them up all infinitely many of them. So I can use an integral, but it looks like I'm missing something now. What am I missing? I need. I need the intersection because I need to know where I'm going to start my rectangles out and where I'm going to end my rectangles. So you have to, what, set those curves equal to one another? All right, let's set them equal to one another. The intersection. You set x squared equal to 4 minus x squared, and that gives you 2x two, uh, two squared equals 4, which means x equals plus or minus root 2. Divide by 2, take square root. Yeah? And that's it. See, this formula that we're coming up with here, right, that we came up with, it's not, like, it's not like washers and shells where we give you this like, like generic formula that you use 
when you're rotating, this is like every problem you have to develop the formula for that particular problem, right? So I'm, I'm ready for the answer, which we're not going to evaluate the integral, we're just going to set it up. So if we set this up, the volume of the entire thing, okay, not the volume of this little one, the whole thing, is going to be the integral, <coughs> negative root 2 to root 2. Do I need to put pi or 2 pi or anything out here? No, it's not part of our formula, right? And then we put our formula inside. So 4 minus 2x squared squared dx. There it is. I just want us to think back. I don't know, let's see if this actually resonates at all with you. Do you remember when I first introduced the integral and I said, um, the definite integral, sorry. And I said, look, this, this right here is the height of a rectangle and this is the width and we're looking at the area and we're adding it up, right? I said, but, but later on, it's gonna be important for us to understand that the thing in here is actually gonna be something we generate. It's gonna be, it's gonna represent different things depending on what we're trying to do. So when we look at this integral now, you know, if, if someone just gave you that without all the background information to it, you would have no idea that this represents the volume of this weird shaped thing, right? But that's what it is. This right here is the formula for the, sl for the little slab, right? That's what it is for this particular problem. So this starts, the, the integrand, all this in here, um, starts to take on kind of a different meaning, I guess that it's just a formula for whatever it is you're trying to add up. Whatever that may be. If it's a washer or a shell or a bunch of little cuts out of a thing. So do, do you, can you appreciate the power of the integral? That you can really just add anything up, right? All right, let's do the same problem, part B. I'm gonna skip a lot of the drawing. I'm just gonna get to, can I just draw the slab yeah. for part B? For part B, what is my slab going to look like? It's going to be like a triangle, like this, but it's going to have a little bit of thickness to it, like that. So how do you find the volume of this? <clears throat> and you know, we never really talked about this. I shouldn't overlook it. <clears throat> if you have, have three-dimensional shape, that goes straight, straight down. So these sides are straight down. Any shape where it goes straight down for a certain, let's say, height, then what is the volume of this shape? Well, you need to know what the area of this is. If you know the area of that top flat piece, then the volume of this is always just the area times the height. It's just whatever that area is times how deep the object is, all right? So when we look at this, if we could find the area of this triangle, then its depth is dx, isn't it? Okay, so I just need a formula for that area. That's all I need. Agree? Okay. Sounds simple enough? It's not, though. It's a little bit involved, okay? Can you tell me how long that side is? Where did it come from? It came from our two graphs, right? Where, where they hit each other, we took a slice right here. And so it's still that, this one minus that one, right? Still the same thing is, the base of this triangle is the same as the base of the square was. So that's still four minus two x squared, right? And this is dx. But is that right there enough for you to tell me what the area of that is? So how are you going to tell me the area of that? Cut it what? You want me to cut it in half? Okay, so I think I know what you're doing. Hold on. All these markers are terrible. That's I'm, uh, I was very upset. I went to the math uh, office the other day to get more markers. They have them in this drawer and I take the markers, I grab some red ones and stuff, and I open them, and they had like black and blue on the tips. So you know what they're doing? They're like coming back into these rooms, and they're grabbing these things off the, 
off of here and putting them back in there for us. <laughs> so if you don't like paying for them, then give us some chalkboards. I wish we had chalkboards. I know you don't like that, but I, I do. All right, so I think this is what you're saying. I think what you're saying is let's go back to... God, damn it. Yeah, but, you know, they all suck. They're all... I know I do because they kind of recharge after a little while. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They. Okay, so there. I think what you're suggesting is that since we know what this is, I think you're suggesting dropping a perpendicular straight down the middle like that and cutting it. Am I correct in saying that? And then what? How do you solve for the area? I'm not quite sure I follow. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but do I know that height? No. I don't know what that height is. But I can get it how? Okay, so I think this is what you're saying. If I were to look at just half of that triangle, I know this side is 4 minus 2x squared, right? Yeah. I know that because it's equilateral, so that all sides are the same. Now this from here to here is no longer that, right? It's half of it. So if I divide that by 2, it's actually 2 minus x squared. Luckily for us, it's nice, right? Divide each by two, right? And then if we want to know this height, we could do like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Yeah. So I could do a squared plus b squared equals c. Oh, I missed the two. Do you all agree I could do this? Yeah. Okay, now this is not the way that I'm, I'm going to show you to do it. We're going to do it this way because we're going to get to the answer, but I'm going to show you something else after this. Because um, this will get you there, all right? So look at this. This is 4 minus 4x squared plus x to the fourth. That's that, that's that thing expanded. Plus h squared equals huh, 16 minus 16x squared plus 4x to the fourth. I'm doing this in my head quickly. I think that's all good. And then we are, what are we solving for? H, H right? So H squared is, let's see. How about x's to the fourth? Got x to the fourth here, four of them, taking away one, right? Yeah. So three of the x's to the fourth, and then 12, is it negative 12x squared? And then positive 12 plus 12, right? Are we agreeing? That's h. And then square root it. h equals the square root of that. I think that might factor. I think this thing would have factored. Look at this. Now, I, I wouldn't expect that you would necessarily see this right away, but if we take that and we pull a 3 out, we would be left with x squared minus 4x. I'm sorry, x to the fourth, right? Yeah. x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 4. Yeah. And that's x squared minus 2 squared. You all see that? x squared minus 2 squared, that's what that is. So when I come back here and I take the square root of that, what would I have really gotten had I taken the square root? Root 3, and then the square root of that would have just been x squared minus 2, right? That's what h would have been, cleaned up. So now I know what the height of this is. This is root 3, x squared minus 2. Yes? Okay, so what is the area... What is the area of that triangle right there? One half, one half of base times height, but wasn't that only half of it? So I need to multiply that by two. So it's just base times height, isn't it? So it's just this times this, which would be, so I'm coming up with a little formula for this. The formula is root three times, root three times that times that. Those are the same thing or no? Or they take a negative out of this. Uh, you know what?